So one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha is that we are all conditioned in permanent phenomena. Everything is, arises from causes and conditions, changing moment by moment. And so through living here at the Abbey, doing the Exploring Monastic Life program, practice of purification, living together, it's like sooner or later you get to explore all the conditioning that has impacted this per particular impermanent phenomena called oneself. So I keep, this has really come up for me lately, thinking that from the time we are born until the time we breathe our last breath, we are taking in and responding to all kinds of conditioning, all kinds of influences that inform us, color our view, mold us, and impact us. You know, from the time we're born, is even before that, that's right, Venerable, the music. <laughs> I'm working on the, this life. <laughs> so even before then, right, the Buddhist worldview is you come in with a suitcase of already quite a bit of conditioning. You come in with not a blank slate, but a large whiteboard that has lights around it that already has quite a bit of verbiage on it. But when you come into this life, the first thing is, is it a boy or a girl? Okay, so conditioning starts right away there. Spoken or not spoken? Then there are issues of race, ethnicity. What's the family constellation? I mean, who is in your life? There are very extended families, nuclear families, your neighbors, people in your life, your social groups. And how do they speak? How do they act? How do they think? And how much of that informs and impacts us? There is our religious conditioning, socioeconomic, our environment. Where do we live? What type of landscape? What kind of neighborhoods, climate? education, socialization. I mean, we are like sponges through all of our life. And so what we, and including the entertainment. I mean, back in my days, it was Walter Cronkite, uh, Leave it to Beaver, and Life magazine. Now, I, cannot, I, can, I can hardly contain <laughs> even the possibility what, what, how much influence and conditioning is coming from entertainment and social media and culture. And as a Buddhist, all the work, all the spiritual work is done in here. But there's a lot of stuff that we work on in here that comes from out there and how to be able to do that. So this past week, Venerable said, well, we come to the Abbey with these bags chock full of stuff. I mean, we have a set of luggage. You know, we've had it from previous lives that comes in chock full of all sorts of stuff or a slate that has all sorts of erroneous conceptions and beliefs and assumptions. But somewhere, sooner or later, the Dharma, the power of the Dharma, is like stirring the depths. And that stuff begins to come to the surface. You cannot practice the Buddha's teachings. You cannot live in community. You cannot open yourself up to training to cultivate your potential without having the Dharma stir up that stuff. And if we want to develop compassion and wisdom and generosity, we've got to deal with a lot of this misinformation, this erroneous conclusions and assumptions we make about what we think is happening in our life and how it impacts us. And that there is a lot of behaviors and thinking that are so counterproductive to what we truly, truly want and what we truly, truly dream for the best of us. So the spiritual practice, the Buddha's teachings, compel those forward and luckily for us, we have tools, incredible tools that at some point can help us to identify what are some of those conditioning factors, how to identify them, to assess them. Are they worth keeping? I mean, most of the stuff that happened is, non, is gone, gone bye-bye, but we have these ghosts of those experiences still in our hearts. So the Buddha Dharma helps us to have some kind of assessment, some kind of wisdom to say, okay, what's helpful? So what, because what we want to develop, these beautiful hearts and minds of love and compassion, we've got to be able to clear them. We've got to unburden them with a lot of these influences that may not be helpful. And I want to, you know, kind of say that not all the conditioning that we have is harmful or counterproductive. We have a lot of incredible qualities that we generate and we nourish due to the environments, due to the family, due to our religious upbringing. So I don't want to dismiss that but they don't tend to get in the way 
of us being able to develop our good qualities. They're not where the hindrances apply or where the hindrances happen. So I wanted to give you some examples of <laughs> some things that are um, obnoxious but mostly harmless or little irritating behaviors and conditionings and things that are much deeper that have a greater impact. Um, and this has been happening, I don't know whether it's because I'm getting older, but the long-term memories seem to be coming much quicker to the forefront. And the short-term memory is receding. So I know the names of, I figured out, I had this incredible, these images that are coming up this week are just so powerful, but I, have the, I had the names of all the neighbors in Levittown on, 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 Vermilion, on Vermilion Lane, Valor Lane, but I can't tell you what I had for breakfast three days ago. So, and, and then I have to say, well, what, what about this, these memories? Is it worth it? You want to, you know, let's take it out of the suitcase and say, okay, I'm done with this. Or is there something that I can learn, something that I can develop in a good way? So here are some of the annoying but somewhat harmful things that I learned, okay? This is one of them. <laughs> I can't tell you how many pictures of me in the Abbey Photo Library have me looking like this. This is a Jenny. This is my mom, except she would have her hands on her hips when something was going on that she didn't like or she was having yeah, a little hissy fit at the moment. That was, this, this mouth happened. The other thing from, okay, this one. <laughs> That's Paul Nesbitt. And I saw my dad used to pick his nose and do exactly the same thing. Brian does it, and my sister does, did it. This little, just going like that and going like this with your knuckle. I, I can't tell you how many times a day I catch myself doing this, mostly unconscious. The third thing that's kind of uh, just, <laughs> it says a lot about me, is my dad was a traveling salesman. And he, he represented um, Goodyear and Azrock linoleum and tile, which is why I have such a proclivity towards the linoleum flooring and wood flooring. My dad was a traveling salesman who sold flooring. And so he had to make appointments. He was in New Jersey, Allentown, Scranton, Philadelphia area. So he, he had these tight schedules on, on doing these appointments with people who had homes or businesses. So we would have the Sunday drive. And we would go to Goodnose, just like Venerable said. Everybody in that era would go out with their families in the car. And in Bucks County, we have the most beautiful, just beautiful countryside. It's the home of Pearl Buck and James Mitchell on the Delaware, just gorgeous. And my dad, and, and there's all these other families out there doing their Sunday drive. And here's my dad tailgating somebody until he gets a whole bunch of yellow dotted lines, hits the gas, passes them and goes, Sunday driver! <laughs> So you can now wonder why I have such a lead foot around here. It's a Paul Nesbitt salesman, got to get to the next place. We got to get to good nose. And along the way, whether you're looking at the nice fields and the horses rollicking, it doesn't matter. You have to get to the next place. But I also got from him a love of gardening. He was a wonderful rose gardener. Okay, so on, and, and it's interesting to watch each other. We all have these, these nonverbal mannerisms that are quirky at best and mostly unconscious. I can never promise I'm going to stop any of those, but those are things that, that came up for me. The second one are, well, the family issues, okay? This is the conditioning that I find that's coming up right now is just these memories about the skeletons in the closet, you know, swept under the rug, the family secrets, you know? And I've given a lot of thought to this. I mean, I've worked decades on these skeletons in the closet where, you know, they're all gone, Bye-bye, they're in, they're not, don't even exist anymore. But, you know, do I still need this stuff? You know, there was some kind of loss, some kind of grief, betrayal, accident, addiction, something at the time of the family life that had put the family in a situation where it just couldn't deal with it. It couldn't deal with that level of suffering. So it got swept underneath the carpet. Now, some family members knew, most of the grown-ups, a lot of the children didn't but we were impacted nonetheless. Now, I've looked over a lot of this in my life, and I can't really tell you what the motivation is. You know, it could be fear of retaliation, shame, blame, uh, attachment to reputation, grief that's too much and no tools to handle it. So that's another part that conditions and impacts us very much, whether we know it or not. 
And as a result, and we can see this in community, at least I can, I can see it in myself, that we, we garner these coping skills with this unspoken whatever happened back there with those things that got swept under the carpet. We either retreat or we fight or we escape, we sulk, we become the clown in the room, we get this cold silence. Any way in which that our hearts can deal with whatever's, whatever memory's coming up that's triggering it. And that it leaves, you know, our behaviors are, are impacted by the, our worldview, our tendency to fill in the blank, whatever that is. These family secrets, they just play themselves out. And they're in the suitcase that now has wheels because you've been carrying this for 40, 50, 60 years. And that the secrets and this concealment not just are impacted by the family, but your neighborhood, your school. I mean, we had... In our school, in the, when I was a child, there was a, li a little boy that had leukemia. His mom was the organist. And this little boy courageously went to school. You could see his hair getting thin when he had chemo. And one day, he didn't come to school anymore. And his younger brother just courageously trying to navigate this, and mom playing the organ every Sunday while her son is dying. Or the, in high school, the girls that kept getting bigger, bigger bellies, and then one day they went away and they never came back. And nobody ever said anything about, you know, unmarried girls, 16-year-old girls that are pregnant and have children. It was kind of not ever spoken about. But what's interesting about skeletons in the closet is that they're basically elephants in the room. You know, no matter how much that secret was kept, there's just so much going on that tries to navigate to keep this secret under wraps that it's basically like an elephant in the room. And that can, it can live in the room for decades until all of us in some way take matters into our own hands. We, either we go to therapy, we you know, heal from it, we recognize that it's been a hindrance to our joy, hindrance to our happiness, and we end up, I'm gonna do something about this. So, and that's the beauty of the Dharma. So what, two of the things that have come up for me <clears throat> with these memories that were very strongly impacted me as a child, and I didn't realize it until I said, you know, I have such a passionate response when I see a law enforcement officer shoot a young man. It just, there's something about my heart that just breaks about that. And there's not a lot of judgment about it. There's just this heartbrokenness. And when this memory came up last week, I remembered very specifically that there was a neighbor that lived kitty corner to us, Mrs. DeAngelis, and she had a son named Vincent. Now, Levittown was, was grown as a suburb to support the, the Korean vets who came back from Korea. They could buy houses for like $10,000, come and settle themselves after the war. Mrs. DeAngelis didn't have a husband. We don't know what happened to Mr. DeAngelis. But as a result, whatever happened in that condition, Vincent was part of our little tribe of kids, but he was always a little bit angry, always a little bit volatile, always a little bit bullying, was truant in school, and you could hear mom trying to get him in line. Well, when he was 15 years old, one day we saw in the newspaper that he had been shot trying to steal in the hardware store. One of the Falls Township police officers either got called to the hardware store, which was a 10-minute walk from our house, to say that someone was breaking in, and he shot Vincent. There was never a word in our neighborhood about that. You could hear Mrs. DeAngelis hanging her clothes in her backyard, sobbing, and nobody ever talked about it. And then the, the, the family next door, the, the O'Haras, Mr. O'Hara would go to work. He worked at the steel mill. We had a lot of steel mill workers in our neighborhood. He'd stumble on home from Rockies at 11 o'clock at night, and you'd hear the screaming and the fighting and the beating in the house next door. Nobody ever said anything. Nothing was said. We had at least, I can't tell you how many families that surrounded our own little loving, dysfunctional family in that neighborhood. And so, so when I look at these memories, I go, what was the condition? What impacted those families? I can only uh, surmise. But what it does is it said, it just breaks my hope, my, my mind open. It just, it just softens everything. This, these are our conditions. This is samsara at its rawness, at its most painful. Single mothers with troubled children and husbands that deal with their pain by drinking. I don't, you know, that's a, that's a samsara experience. So I have a, I've had a lot of these this week looking at these memories and saying, okay, this is the beauty of the Dharma, that it gives me an option to reframe these 
to be able to that when people suffer, when they're afraid, when there's erroneous thinking, how can I reframe my life? How can I reframe the impact that it had on me in order to be able to nourish my compassion, my love, and my wisdom, and not to be lost in this nostalgia and this sense of sadness? You know, this is really, you know, to deal with my fear of anger, my, my deal, of, you know, my, my thing about concealing and sneaking around sometimes and not being transparent, they're all coping mechanisms. And part of my practice is to address them and say, is this healthy or not? So to be able to develop our love and compassion, to take whatever conditioning, to nourish the ones and to rejoice in the ones that we have that grew our good qualities, and the ghosts of the past, to be able to say, okay, is this helpful? I want to take some things out of my suitcase. You know, I want to die with the least amount of stuff in my suitcase for the next journey. And so part of living in this community and this particular spiritual path, I have found personally to be one of the best unpacking uh, tools that I've ever had in my life for some fairly deep conditioning uh, that was basically part of the deal of being born in, in dying and getting sick, and, and this is it. But to, to, do, to look at it with a tenderness and a wisdom now, and to really, really to move forward with a lot of joy that I've got this opportunity to really unpack that suitcase and, um, and to, really, um, yeah, to really rejoice in that. So that's what's been coming up for me in the past two weeks, is this long-term memories, using them to unpack this big suitcase. 